and we are live. All right. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? You're listening to episode 12 of the podcast brought to you today by Joshua Davidson. That's me and Mr. Dan Dejani because Eddie Contento is too cool to be on the show. So, Dan, it's finally happened. The hostile takeover of just you and I and um, no more Eddie. It's officially happened. Man, how do you feel about this? I've been staging this coup for at least three weeks or three episodes now, so it's finally coming to flourishion. <laughs> and we have we have Mr. Peter Reinhardt as witness. But what's going on, Peter? It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to meet you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you guys. Welcome. So, you know, number one, let, for those who are just listening to this right now and are about to join in this moment, can you give a little context about who you are and what segment is? Like a quick 60-second overview, and we'll go in a higher level throughout this conversation. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Peter. I'm one of the I'm the, one of the co-founders and the CEO here at Segment. So Segment is a data infrastructure company. We started about uh, five years ago, went through sort of like a year and a half of failure. Uh, and then in the last three and a half years, really sort of like hit on an idea and uh, started growing. So we're now about 80 people. I would raise three rounds of financing. Um, have about 7,000 customers and basically help companies collect data and then uh, use it in all their different marketing tools, uh, in data warehouses, etc. So out of curiosity, I want to start first actually talking about Segment before we go into you. How sure. did the idea originate? So how did you and your founders, when they say, we should start a company called Segment, uh, Segment that's going to focus on data. Like, how did you decide one day, this is what I want to spend my life doing, like my ever waking moment? Yeah, so uh, it didn't it didn't actually start that way at all. So we started as a education technology company actually in the spring of 2011. Uh, it was called Class Metric, and the idea was that students would, uh, you know, they could open their laptops in the middle of class and they'd get this button to push to say, "I'm confused," and then the professor would get this chart over time of like how confused their students were. Um, I love and that. The, the professors would be able to improve their lectures, and that students would, you know, have a way to raise their hand anonymously, as it were. And uh, we got into Y Combinator with that in the summer of 2011, raised like 600K coming out of Y Combinator demo day. And then we put it in the classroom as we went into the, into the fall semester. We moved back to Boston and we had it going into like 20 or 30 classrooms. And basically it was just like an unmitigated disaster because um, the students would open their laptops and they'd just go straight to Facebook. Uh, <laughs> and the professors had this like real time feed that they like weren't responding to because they were just going through their lecture anyways, like a freight train. Um, so yeah, it was total disaster about 45, 60 days after raising our 600K coming out of demo day, we had to call back all the investors and um, basically like say, hey, we're gonna like totally work on a different idea. Um, so that was a little rough, uh, but most of them decided that you know we invested for the team. So, so this is a bit of a long answer to your question, but- uh, no, no, it's awesome, awesome. We wanna go yeah. to high level here. So the higher the level, the more detail we go in, awesome. Cause I think context is really it's huge for yeah. the story. So, you know, starting with it, is this your first venture like successfully or have you been kind of like have an entrepreneur path over your years leading up to this? Yeah, so we, um, we it was it was our first venture. We were, we had been in our junior year at MIT. So it was myself and, and two of my roommates, which is why we were sort of into this whole ed tech idea. Um, and anyways, once we, once we pivoted from that idea, we decided to build an analytics tool like Mixpanel or Kissmetrics and, um, we spent about like a year and a little bit more building all the infrastructure and uh, you know getting ready to sort of like release this product into the wild. Uh, and it, it turns out that the analytics market is just super, super crowded. There's a lot of companies doing interesting things. Uh, as founders, we were engineers and uh, you know, it wasn't great founder market fit. I think like a, a more marketing sales bent has better in, in that market currently. Um, and uh, so, you know, we got to December of 2012, a year and a half into sort of the founding of the company. And we still basically had nothing. We had not, no customers. We'd been burned through from 600K down to about uh, like maybe 100K left uh, in, in cash that we had raised. And so that was like sort of the, the, the dark, dark era. Uh, but if you rewind the clock, so this is getting back to your question of like, how did, we, how did we discover segment? If you rewind the clock all the way back to the very beginning of class metric, in that first week in the summer of 2011 in Y Combinator, we had we were working on this education technology product, and we were like, you know, we should have analytics on this thing. So we Googled it, and we found Google Analytics, Kissmetrics, and Mixpanel. And we were, we were thinking like, well, okay, but the, the way that these analytics tools collect data is exactly the same. They collect the same data, they use it in the same way, they have the same charts, everything. 
So like, why, uh, how, are we, how are these tools different? We couldn't make up our minds. So we came up with this very engineering solution, which was we wrote this JavaScript library that could send data to all three of those tools. So we would implement it once, and then we would just send it to all three, and we'd like figure it out later. And then about once every four months or so, we would sort of improve this, uh, improve this library, eventually pulled it out. Uh, by this time, we were working on an analytics product. And uh, my co-founder, Ilya, was like, you know, I think we should uh, use this as a growth hack. Like, we should add our analytics tool as the fourth service that we can send data to. And then we'll, like, open source this library and let people use it. Because the problem was, every time we tried to sell our analytics tool, the customers would be like, yeah, but I already have Mixpanel installed. Right? Like, I, I'm both, so why, why, how should I install your tool? And so we would hit them with this library. and would say, oh, well, here's analytics.js. Like, you can send your data to both and then get a fair comparison. And so people really liked the library. Uh, and after a few months of that, it started getting some stars on GitHub. It started getting like pull requests. People were liking it. And uh, so then my co-founder Ian was like, you know, I think there's actually a really big business behind this open source library. Like, screw our analytics product. Like, I think there's like a really big business there. Um, and so I was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> this is uh, it's an open source library. It's 580 lines of code. Like, how on earth can you build a big business around that? And so I came in the next day, I was like trying to convince the guys that we shouldn't do it. Uh, and I was like, all right, here's what we'll do. We'll build a landing page, we'll put it up on Hacker News and we'll like see what happens. Um, so we did that and I thought it would just go to the bottom and we'd be done with it. But instead it went straight to the top, got like you know a thousand stars on GitHub in the first day. And that sort of like launched the whole thing. We got a couple thousand people signed up for the product. And So you literally uh, did the lean startup, uh, startup mythology almost accidentally by just saying, let's see if people want this. And the man said yes, pretty much, and act type of contract. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean, it was really like, like I really didn't believe it, which in sort of the like argument and skepticism inside the founding team, I think sort of like forced the issue of like, you gotta, you gotta prove it to me. <laughs> that's, no, so listen, that's remarkable. Uh, as my company, Chopped All, one of the things we did when we early on pivoted to working with a lot of early stage companies and enterprises, we, we realized we were getting to a very saturated market ourselves. And what we did is ad work campaigns to see which had the highest click through rate, were ideas we had as a business model, like what would be the most demand as a customer. So we would put like a hundred bucks to validate an idea, like would there be demand here building an agency catering this audience by putting AdWords to see what would be the percentage of click through rate off of it. So we did the exact same thing. We don't talk about that a lot, but you know, so what you're saying is actually brilliant to me because think about how many companies you hear often that blow through VC funding left and right without truly validating it, right? Like truly, like it's, yeah. it's a before amount. And you and you guys kind of proved it by just putting up, you know, you said you use like a service, a great landing page, or you just had someone just put it up real quick, right? Yeah, I mean, it was just it was like a, just a nice marketing page. It had a bunch of content and docs and like a drop your email address here. But I mean, to be to be fair, like we we spent the first year and a half doing the normal thing. It's not validating sure. anything, um, which was horrible. Uh, and in fact, we had we had like our office hours with Paul Graham uh, on the day that we put it up on Analytics.js on, up on Hacker News, and I think he, you know, we burned through. From 600k to 100k, and I remember him saying, "Like, um, so let me get this straight: you've burned through half a million dollars, and you're back to square one again." And it was like that was like a—I mean, it was very true. Like, it's a totally fair thing to say, but at the same time, it was like, "Oh shit, yeah, we did." Um, I have to ask: <laughs> Was there any leftovers of at all of the original startup that went through YC or the original products into what you are now, or was it literally a chop it off? start the new thing and let's run with it? Uh, we chopped it off and started a new, like product wise, we chopped it off and started a new thing twice. And then how did, how did that conversation, I mean, like, it feels like it was very, we asked, you know, you said, uh, we went and told the investors the 600K we raised and that was it. I mean, there has to be more to that. That's like, what was that kind of like, what was that conversation? How was that process chain, you know, like you said with Paul and all the others that are there, like, hey, this is where we're at and here's where we're going. <laughs> yeah, there's a, yeah, there's so, so, a couple aspects to that. One, yeah, we had just raised it, which made it all the more awkward, right? Because like we hadn't spent any of it, um, so it was you know there to be paid back. So we actually, I think we actually raised like eight hundred and something coming out of demo day. Um, but when we uh, pivoted, and or not really pivoted, we like did a three hundred and sixty or whatever, started in a whole new direction. Um, we, yeah, it was tough. I just called back all each of our investors and was like, hey, this isn't working. Like you don't want us to work on this. We're going to work on something else. Um, and like, sorry, I know that's what we pitched you on, but, um, and if you feel really comfortable with that, happy to pay you back. And uh, two investors actually did take us up on that offer. And so we paid back too. Um, 
uh, and the rest I discovered later. The rest basically wrote us off as a loss, uh, which you know is, is good for them now. Um, but um, yeah, and I, I think uh, the yeah. Anyways, I, I, the, the the amounts that investors write at that level is you know they write like a hundred k check or two hundred k check. You think like holy shit, like a hundred k check um, on like a personal level, right? But for a lot of these, not for angel investors, but for a lot of the funds that we're raising from, like 100K or 200K is, uh, like it's not it's not that much. It's almost noise on their checkbook if they're investing out of like a $1.5 billion fund, sure. right? That's like 0.01% of their fund. So it's not, it's almost managing like small. So I, I have to ask when you, how daunting was it in your position? So I'm assuming you've been the CEO as, I guess, actually, let me re take a step back for ask this yeah. question. Early on with you and your founding team, how did you guys ultimately determine whose role is going to be what with the company or companies as you kind of figure out the direction? Was that early on or did you guys just naturally go into a role and like, all right, I guess I'm now CEO, like just one day. Like, how did that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's I think it's uh, we didn't we didn't have like super strict titles early on, but it was pretty obvious, like who was going to have titles later on. Um, I think the. You know, like when we when we presented at Y Combinator demo day, uh, you know, I was the one presenting, and like that was a choice that we made. That was like it was more decisions about who's doing what as opposed to like the titles. Um, so one decision was, yeah, who's going to present at demo day? Like, okay, well that's going to be Peter. Okay, well then that means he's going to do the follow up meetings with investors and like so on and so forth. And so um, pretty quickly, like later on, you put a title on that, which is like, okay, that well, that was that was CEO. Um, and uh, you know, later you put on like, okay, well you know. Calvin is really doing all the infrastructure engineering here. So like, okay, he's the CTO. Uh, so it was really, it was, it was like naturally happened. It pretty much naturally yeah. took person and when they're like, all right, well, for the purpose of semantics, you're now this officially has this title, you're this title. Yeah. So, and really like the titles really only matter in so much as like, uh, it comes to external things, right? It's, um, like clarity on who someone's talking to and what their role is in an organization. Like, it really only matters as an organization gets big or when you're dealing with someone externally and they want to know, like, am I talking to the right person? I actually feel like too many early stage companies focus way too much on titles and it's more of a distraction because ultimately you're wearing many hats anyway, right? Even yeah. if you're yeah. CEO day one, are you really being CEO? You're also engineer, you're also designer, you're also developer, you're also marketing, you're also sales, you're also HR, right? So it's kind of like you're doing everything early on. So I, I do agree with you. It's, it is. But it's interesting to me to figure out the dynamics and the answer you're giving is surprising to me, but it's true. That happens more often than not. It just naturally happens. People discover their roles and you know they almost don't even have that dialogue. It just becomes, all right, well, we need to finally get printed, business cards printed. I'm gonna put you as this title, is that cool? Like that's how really the conversation ends up. So yep. go ahead, Dan. I was gonna say that kind of, and again, I hate to keep jumping back and forth, but you have like a really interesting story here. And the thing I'm kind of wondering is, is you know, you said you and your co-founders, two co-founders, correct? Uh, three co-founders. Three co-founders. Oh, sorry. Wow. Three other co-founders. Gotcha. Okay. And you guys were all majorly on the engineering side, correct? Yeah, it was uh, myself, two of my, so I studied aerospace engineering. Uh, okay. Two co-founders who were my roommates at MIT, they studied computer science. And then a friend of ours from Rhode Island School of Design, and he studied design. So what it kind of makes me wonder is, is you know, and again, maybe this is where YC kind of played a role was, um, you know, being very engineer heavy, how did you guys kind of support, like Josh was saying, like wearing those other hats and, you know, trying to cover those other things. Like you said, like, we're not, you know, we're not marketing guys. We're not analytics guys, or sorry, let's say marketing, you know, like how do you, how did you guys kind of make that transition? Yeah. Sorry, marketing. And then, um, you know, like, has that changed now that you guys have kind of grown into a more established company with customers and actually having to start to, you know, attach those titles to what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, so early on, um, the other guys weren't that interested in uh, doing sales or, or other things. So I think um, like a pretty good amount of support and sales and stuff just sort of fell to the one of us that was most likely to be happy doing that or, or just uh, who was most willing to take it on, which was me. So a lot of those things fell to me. And then over time, we um, hired great people into the company who could do it much better than, than us. Um, so, you know, now we have a whole sales team and some of our first hires were in support and sales. Um, beginnings of a marketing team now. So I think uh, it, it just fell to, it happened to fall to me in this case, but these things just tend to fall to whoever is most interested in it um, because everyone is just trying to get everything done. Yeah. Um, but, um, so you know, now over time, of course, we, we build out teams that, that uh, specialize that and, and do it much, much better. than. than I want to definitely go even to more operations first hire, but I got to ask, 
you personally, what is your origin? So where did you originally like grow up out of for context? Who is you guys? Can you hear us? Oh, come on. The internet can't go out when we're talking to the tech startup out of San Fran. <laughs> is, is, isn't Google Fiber coming to San Francisco? I heard that's that's the case. So I hope I hope he comes back because this oh, is he's there. I'm, yeah, a, I'm an engineer, so like I'm super excited to be talking. This is going to be one of my favorite episodes because I'm such a geek. <laughs> and there's a lot of developers that listen to the show. In that's, fact, if you're a developer, you're listening to this little hiatus we have. Please tweet us with hashtag hiatus chop dog just to see how many. <laughs> oh, there it is. Right, Peter, are you back? Sorry, I don't know what happened there. No worries. We were just saying how it. You're the San Francisco company here. You're the one losing the internet connection, man. So like, at least he's a little iffy there, man. San, San Francisco internet is terrible. With the, the irony. All, all, all the startups moved to San Francisco because it was cheap. Right? And that's obviously not anymore. But uh, it's like a recent thing that uh, you have a bunch of tech companies here. It used to be down in, down in Silicon Valley. So all the, all the internet infrastructure is still catching up. So I want to. So what the question I asked right before that we lost you was, for for more context on your own personal backstory, where are you from originally? Like, where did you grow up? Yes, yeah, so I, I was born in Seattle, uh, and then I grew up in Pullman, Washington, uh, for the first five years. I don't know if you know where that is. It's uh, it's like a small college town um, in far eastern Washington, uh, Washington State. It's in the middle of the like uh, wheat field, so like beautiful. You should Google it if you haven't seen it before. It's the Palouse, uh, like beautiful rolling wheat fields. Um, turn bright gold in the in the fall uh, and then moved back to Seattle when I was six uh, and then went to college in Boston at MIT and then we moved back to San Francisco uh, around Y Combinator. And I got to say, how did you decide you're at MIT for aerospace and decide I'm going to get into at the time an educational based tech startup? Like what made you say, all right, I'm going to go from this all the way to this while I'm at MIT doing this? Yeah, so I was... Um, that's a good question. I was always really excited about education, um, and both of my roommates were computer science. I was studying like the uh, aerospace engineering, which included like thermodynamics and control theory and um, like structures and all that sort of stuff. But really, I was spending most of my time doing programming, so the control theory side of, of aerospace engineering, uh, and that and that side of aerospace engineering is actually like sort of like computer science. Uh, and so it, it wasn't actually that much of a stretch from that to gotcha. uh, hack gotcha. things on things you know, over independent activities period in January at MIT or uh, over the weekends with uh, with Calvin Ilya. And uh, so from there, it sort of fell naturally into building various web services and and uh, apps and stuff like that. So gotcha. So let's talk about you, you guys are just starting your educational tech, uh, tech startup. What yeah. made you guys decide, hey, we're going to apply to Y Combinator to get into this? So how did that conversation originate? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we had, so we had started following uh, Hacker News maybe like a year and a half before that. Uh, Calvin had started following it, and then he showed Ilya and I, so we were like reading on there constantly. Started seeing some of Paul Graham's essays, which were really inspiring about like, you know, how to think about starting a company, how to think about building products. And uh, then in the fall of 2010, Ilya and I decided to take this class called Founder's Journey. Uh, at MIT. And the idea was that every week they would bring in a new founder and uh, the founder would talk about their story. And the, and the, and the first one was uh, this guy, Adam Smith, who founded this company called Zobni. He actually just launched his new product today, uh, started a new company recently. It's called Kite, Kite HQ, check it out. Um, and at any rate, he told the story about how he had um, founded Zobni back then and raised like $45 million and like built the company. And I was just like, I was blown away. I was like, holy crap, this guy is like incredible, like I was totally floored. Um, and afterwards, Ilya and I were just milling around, uh, getting food or drinks or whatever after the event. And Ilya was like, yo, I'm gonna go ask him if he wants to come back to the dorm for beers. I was like, what, don't do that? They're gonna be horribly embarrassed. And he's gonna, obviously gonna say no. Um, and Ilya's like, yeah, whatever, I'm doing it. Um, so he just like, walks over, he's like, yo, Adam, you wanna come back to the dorm and get some beers? He's like, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> That's the greatest hack I've ever heard, man. You wanna get yeah. You're a college student. You want to talk to someone off free beers. Yeah, and so we we're like, oh shit, all right. Um, but it, it like it like took founding like founders sort of status from like this is like this incredible person to like yeah, but he's also a normal dude and he's just like he's in my dorm drinking beer. Like I I can do that. Um, that's great perspective though. I think that's you know not to cut you off. We'll keep going the story, but I think a lot of people in the startup world idolize these these individuals who in reality yeah. are just everyday people who just executed incredibly well on what they were trying to do, right? 
but they're still just people at the end of the day. So I feel like yeah. there's almost that kind of like barrier. It's like the same thing as a kid you're looking up to like a bit, an athlete in professional sports. In reality, that athlete's still just a normal person that had a <laughs> life, still has a life. Can shoot a lot of really good layups. <laughs> <laughs> Give us up to uh, play baseball. <laughs> I think that's a huge mental barrier there. Uh, and yeah, so that was the sort of first breaking of mental barrier was like, no, this is just a normal person. I mean, he's, he's an incredible dude, but at the same time, like, uh, you know, founding is not a crazy thing to, th to consider doing. Um, and then the class was taught by this guy, Hamont Taneha, uh, who was a venture capitalist at uh, General Catalyst. And he, at the end of the class, was like, hey, if anybody wants to come by my office, they can pitch me on their idea. Um, it'll be super fun. Like, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll definitely give that a shot. So way, I went. What a great hack as a professor that's a VC to learn from your students. So you can invest in them. You can learn what their work habits are like in your class before you ever even get to talk about their company. That's brilliant. It's like inside yeah. trading right there, man. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah. So he, he, you know, I went to his office and I was like blown away because VC offices are like out of this world. Um, and gave him a pitch and he's like well you know he was being super nice and he's like yeah you know like if, if it works out like and you got some traction like we could totally uh you know we could totally you know write you a check for a couple hundred thousand dollars or, or whatever um which at the time i was like are you kidding me like i've never seen a bank account with more than five thousand dollars and i probably have like six hundred dollars to my name so like, what you, like that's an unimaginable amount of money right um but to him it's again like 0.01 percent of the fund like it's uh it's um but we temporarily it's, lost that yeah yeah um but to them it's just noise right it's just like a tiny fraction of, of the total capital so anyways to that and so like the accessibility of capital was like the second barrier of like wow there's this other i had this other mental barrier about how hard it might be to to raise capital and like okay apparently it's not as hard as i thought uh, and so uh, the sort of like okay i could be a founder and two like actually this whole raising money thing might not be as hard as i thought uh, well, like, let's do it. Uh, and so from there, we, we um, just built on that. So that, that was sort of like the mental preparation. And then it was time to submit for Y Combinator applications. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we just submitted our application. We actually rewrote our application in the hour before submission. It was <laughs> kind of a crazy uh, experience. We'd written it and uh, all about this music app. And then we realized that was a terrible idea and rewrote the entire thing in an hour and a half before. Uh, before the deadline around <laughs> education technology. Uh, now, what year, now, what year did you go to my nominator? Uh, summer of 2011. Oh, 2011. That's awesome. I was going to say, we were on our application. I was going to say, we were on our application. At least in like the last week before it's due. Yeah, at least in like the last week before it's due. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Common theme, I think. So, what I want to know is. So, what I want to know is. <laughs> we're getting a little bit of echo here. We're getting a little bit of echo here. We're getting a little bit of echo here. Quite delay. Quite delay. Yeah, I can't. I can't hear you. It might be coming from you, Peter. You might want to reset. It might be coming from you, Peter. You might want to reset. I think if you have a headphones, it would probably help. Yet, yeah. if you do. Let's see. Testing. All right. No echo. So. All, All right. right. No echo. Oh, so. Nope. All right. <laughs> we'll do this. We'll whisper the rest of this show. Yeah, for the rest of the show. And then we'll edit it out later. All right, Peter, try to call back in. There we go. Let's see if that does it. There we go. Let's see if that does it. Uh oh. How's that? Uh oh. No, we're definitely having a delay. No, we're definitely having a delay right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Best part of editing, right? Best part of editing, right? <laughs> Not a whole lot I can do about that. Uh, I'll see you in a sec. Hey, I'm the host. Who's, all right, so who's in the room here? Neil, Brett, Peter. How about now? Right. Test, test, test. All right, well, it's one. Let's see when Josh enters what happens. Okay, well. In the meantime, let's see, where did we leave? I think we're good. Test, 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 test. Echo, echo, echo. Awesome. All right. It's a very raw episode of the podcast today, Dan. 
we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to the CT over at uh, Blab about this. Hey, what's well, been a guest on our show? Um, <laughs> all right, so going into it, when you apply to Y Comedy, I have to ask, did you guys actually expect to like, get in, or were you guys like naive optimists, like, yeah, maybe it will happen? Like, what was your confidence level when you first applied to Y Uh I think we thought we would get an interview, um, which we did, but then I think we thought that we, we were like, we're definitely not going to pass the interview. <laughs> uh, but, they, but they flew us out. They paid for the things. So we were like, yeah, whatever. Um, we went out there. We did it. We actually had a pretty weird interview. Um, so we, you know, Jessica like ushered you into, or back then when it was Jessica and PG and so forth, that she sort of ushered us into the room. Uh, and then PG started asking us some questions. We like answered them pretty well, I think. And then he's like, oh well, have you run this idea? Because it was just the classroom lecture tool. He's like, have you run this by any professors? And Robert Morris is a professor at MIT, and he's also a partner at Y Combinator, and he was in the room, and we had run the idea by him. So we were like, yeah, you know, well, we rather ran it by like Professor Morris, and uh, and you know, like he he said it, or he thought it'd be a good idea. And he like turns to him and he's like, oh, well, what do you think? And he's like, I'd never use it. <laughs> and we were like, what? <laughs> like just totally threw us under the bus. <laughs> And then, so we were like, oh shit. Uh, and I remember just thinking like, what do I, and I was like, well, we talked to 20 other professors and they all said they would use this. <laughs> Thanks, did you, Robert. Did you ever get an explanation or anything beyond that after that had happened? I, I, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, we, we never bothered to go back and ask <laughs> Especially after the idea of Bill. <laughs> okay, I'll get to that. I don't know if he was just trolling us or if he actually, I don't know. The greatest trolling ever by an adult. <laughs> That's, a good one. That's exactly what it was. So yeah. I, I'm curious, what was the process like in Y Combinator for you guys? Like, talk a little bit about the experience. And was there any big takeaways you took from it that you say, this has totally made it worth it? Or is there anything like, you know what, maybe we would have succeeded without Y Combinator? I'm true from your perspective going through it, what your thoughts are of the time you went through the whole entire. Yeah, there, there is no way that we would have succeeded without Y Combinator. Um, and I think it, it took a long time for the lessons of Y Combinator to like settle in for us. Uh, like Y Combinator is like launch early, launch early, launch early, and then we didn't launch, we didn't launch, we didn't launch for like an entire year and a half, right? Um, which is insane um, in retrospect and uh, was insane at the time too because that's what our advisors were telling us, but eventually it did sink in and then that like launched properly with Analytics.js and then like everything got better. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think like the, the lessons there, like helping us actually um, like create the company, all the legal help early on that they give for free, um, like demo day as a uh, launch opportunity in terms of raising money, uh, like very, very difficult. Each of those things is very difficult and time consuming to figure out by yourself, but it's not necessarily like actually that valuable or unique in terms of like creating value for your unique company. And so the fact that they help you at those moments where you could just go waste a whole bunch of time um, but in, and just sort of accelerate you through those in a big way, it's super helpful. So, um, so it sounds like, yeah. tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. you know, as you know, that uh, you guys, you know, taking away some of those other, call it low value periods of work that, you know, especially when it's not in your wheelhouse. So it sounds like by them, you know, supporting, taking away some of those, like you said, like legal, like I'm sure you guys, law and legal is not your thing. And, you know, them helping support that allowed you guys to really focus on, here's the high value items in my swim lane that I can do and really bring back value to my company and push me towards, like you said, that launch or whatever that next line you're trying to hit was. Yep, that's right. Yep, and I think if we have listened to more of their advice earlier on, you know, there's like a, I, I wrote a blog post recently uh, about our story of finding product market fit, which was the story I told earlier about sort of like failing for a year and a half. Um, and I, I sent it over to, to, to PG and he replied and said, you know, there's like, this is a particularly interesting failure mode because you knew that you were doing it wrong, right? Like you knew during those year and a half that you weren't doing it right. And yet you still did it that way. <laughs> and like this, and it's like, and that's super common. Like so many founders like don't launch, even though they know that they should, they don't. And so like, why, how is like, so he can, he preaches all day that you should launch early and launch and, and just like get in front of your customers. But um, why is it that founders still don't do that? And I, that is actually like somewhat mysterious to me. Like I don't know why we did because we, we did know better. Do you think it was the fear of what happens when you launch? Do you think it was like stubbornness? Like 
if you look back a little bit self-awareness wise, do you think there's any context like maybe this is why, like to the best of your ability? Yeah, I think I think there probably was some fear in there. I think when you like go and tell a whole bunch of people that you're gonna start your own company, they're like a little skeptical and they're like, All right, um, like show us what it's all about then, huh? And uh, if you don't if you yeah, you don't want to launch with something kind of crappy and then um, you know, not not have it look super impressive, which sort of pushes out the launch until it gets more impressive, which is like totally backwards. And I guess the farther you push out the launch, the worse that pressure gets. It's, it's that perfectionism, or it's that you want that perfection that you never can really reach, right? It's your baby, you're emotionally invested to it, it's got everything in it, and it's just it's so hard when you when it finally comes time to push that out. <laughs> well, and you want a little bit of validation from like your friends and family, right? Yep. As a, really, all that matters is validation from customers. Maybe it's a misattribution. Yeah. I've actually, um, I can't think of the book offhand, which dived into that. But on, it, it had more of relationships, but the core people in your lives that you look for that acceptance with, and how, especially in entrepreneurship, those are the people that you're worried about the most. Like, honestly, the outside world doesn't matter, right? But if, you know, let's say it's your relationship with maybe your parents or a significant other or your closest friends or the people you're working with, those are like that core group that really affects the psyche of us and like our actual emotional state of well being. So it's interesting to bring it up because I think we see it all the time. In fact, one of the things that I, I've seen often with our very own clients that we try to be very vocal about is like, you, you have this standard to go up. But when you get this close to launching, all of a sudden you keep raising your standard for whatever reason as you get that closer and closer to launch. And, you know, I, I'm looking at it from a third party element. I'm looking at it like, all right, what's the rationale? Why? I see a lot. It's fear. Um, a lot of times it's just making excuses for the sake of making excuses, which has to stem from something. But you see that often. Um, and sometimes it comes down to embarrassment, which is unbelievable because it's like your mindset wasn't actually set early on and you thought it was, and now you're getting to this position and you're like, actually, no, what my mindset wasn't there. So it's like maybe a lack of clarity at the beginning when you start your journey, figuring out what is that first milestone? What is that supposed to be? And you're not defining it well enough. So now you're hitting that hiccups, that, that hurdle when you get there. So I feel like you can look at multiple different layers there. Yeah, I think it's not just approval of friends and family. I think there's also like the approval of yourself and your like your self identity. Uh, I think like as you go through school, right, you're like doing homework and problem sets and whatever else, and you're like used to answering all the questions and getting a hundred percent or close. Like that's the goal, right? Um, and yet, product development is like almost the opposite. Product development is like, what are you going to say no to? And you've got to get like the ten percent that matters. Yeah, which like getting temper it's like a fundamentally different way of thinking about it. So I, I think there's like a there's also like a personal identity crisis maybe that has to get resolved. Do you do you think it actually could stem from the way we grew up in an environment of basically a school system and going to entrepreneur because entrepreneurship because it is a different game altogether and maybe our wiring the first 18, 20, 22 years of your life has to be completely changed like the playbook has to change yeah. because of the environment you're thrown into. Do you think that could be probably one of the reasons why? Could be. I think if like the if the psychology of like getting everything right uh, is like really deeply set, I could see that being pretty debilitating as a as a founder. Interesting. That's, like that's kind of where I was actually hoping we could go. You know, getting more into a little bit about segment was you know from where you were when you started out and where YC and now where you guys are. Like, how, how big has that transition been? Like, I mean, I'm sure you would tell me I'm not the same guy I was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, but like. Where are you at now and with your business and like with your own, like you said, like your own identity and, the, you know, with the things that you're doing and trying and, and, you know, what your vision is now for your, for what, what's going on for you personally? That's a good question. Uh, I think there were, there were a couple different stages. There was like the super feisty, just like build, 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 just like mad dash to just like get something with traction and getting something together. And that was like the first six months after we released LXJS. I was like, okay, we got something here. We don't know how big it is, um, but like, let's just run with it as fast as possible. And like, we didn't really even have a vision for where we we're going. It was just like the customers want stuff, so we can build it. Um, so we just ran as fast as we could. Um, and then it sort of transitioned, right? We raised two million in funding, uh, and it was like building a team. And so then there was this like rough transition of none of us had ever been on either side of a hiring. Right? Like we had never been hired because we were straight out of college and we had never hired anybody. And I was like, well, now you need to hire a team. Like, what? I don't know how to do that. Um, like no, like what? Um, and so there was a there was like a transition there of like learning to become a a manager uh, for the first time. 
And then I think there was another interesting transition as the company went through like 20 people, 30 people, 40 people of becoming like a manager of managers, me personally. Um, and I think these are sort of just like natural transitions for anyone who's like growing in an org, whether they're founder CEO or not, um, that both of those are, are tough transitions. Uh, and then there's another interesting transition between like right around 50 people. And I think a lot of other people have talked about this as well, but um, something breaks. I don't know if it's like everyone's ability to communicate with everyone or but, like when you pass through 50, you need, like massively more clarity around like what the goals are and like more structure and process around uh, goal setting and, and things like that. So I think like the, the next hurdle for us is, I don't know if you've heard of Dunbar's number, but there's this idea that around like 100 to 200 people is like the max number of people that someone can actually realistically have relationships with. And so right around like 100, 120, uh, companies tend to like pass through another phase where uh, it's very difficult for everyone to sort of communicate with the existing processes and structures that are in place. So that's sort of the next challenge. So how are you handling the communications right now as a team? Like, how are you making sure that all the teams align the same, like, game plan, like, vision? As well, I think culture is a huge aspect. As a team of 80 people, sure. company culture, I think, is one of the most – still, everyone talks about it, but to me, it's still incredibly underrated for the success and failure of major companies. So how are you going about that right now as you guys scale so quickly? Like, how are you focusing on Yeah, this sounds – it's uh... – I, I feel like the answers, I would not, if I looked back a year or two years, I would not appreciate the answers that I'm about to give, uh, which is frustrating. Um, but the there's two things that we put in place. The first is uh, we actually sort of elucidated, when we were about 25 people, we sat down and we tried to elucidate from the things that were going on in the company, what the company values were. Um, and so just the act of writing it down, oftentimes is super powerful. So we, we have like a bit of a saying here that like great managers write, uh, and that's because management often is this thing that's like a bit um, like it's it's ephemeral. Like how do you what what does a manager do? Uh, and so great managers right because it allows their decisions and their processes and everything to be critiqued, studied, um, inspected afterwards, and say like okay, well that didn't work. Um, so just writing down the values is is a huge step I think towards um, um, making them a reality. And then, so that's one thing that we did, and, and I wish that we had done a better job of sort of revising those and continuing to clarify them. We recently did that, but it would have been better if we had done it all along. Uh, and then the other is just a goal setting process, which sounds insane, but like people talk about OKRs from Google or whatever, or at least it sounds insane to me, but just having a system that everyone in the company uses that clarifies, okay, here's what the company is trying to accomplish in the next six months. Okay, then here's what we need to accomplish as teams in the next month. And here's what we as teams need to accomplish in the next like week. And then we just do that every every month religiously. Uh, and the clarity that that brings to uh, individual people around what it is that they need to get done uh, is, is huge. And I think as the company sort of scales through 50, it's no longer super obvious what, um, it's no longer super obvious like what those things are that need to get done because there's so much specialization and so many people working on different things. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those are the two things. It's basically like writing down the values um, that you actually live and then um, having a goal setting process. The two things that really helped us. That's interesting. I wonder, I wonder how many startups will take that to heart, like you said, that, uh, what do you call it? The startup founders that are lost in the clouds and like, it's like, yeah, why would I write that? It doesn't really mean anything. So. I wonder if anyone will take that away. Is it a, an action that they need to take themselves? <laughs> so I want to yeah. know, what does your day-to-day -day look like right now at where your company is right now? Like, what's the average day for you? Good question. Um, let's see. I spend about 25% of my time on product. So that means uh, looking at product briefs and roadmaps and what's getting actually shipped uh, and just critiquing that, um, thinking about sort of the future, uh, so just that sort of giving feedback basically on product. I spend another 25% of my time working on partnerships. So partnerships at Segment is super important uh, because we take data in from our customers and then we fan it out to dozens of tools that they use, right? Uh, and so we're not we're not the end place where you actually use that data. So you can't get any value out of Segment unless you are using one of our partners as well. So our partners are super important. Uh, and so I spend um, probably about a quarter of my time working with the partnerships team, uh, interacting with partners, answering their questions, um, et cetera, thinking about strategy there. Uh, and then I spend about another 25% of my time working on marketing, uh, which right now is hiring for a VP of marketing, uh, as well as 
speaking, uh, writing, publish a lot of content, um, et cetera. And then the remainder of my time is sort of like general management, um, things like finance and goal setting processes, and, uh, critiquing, figuring out office stuff, et cetera. So going back to hiring for a minute, here's a big question. I think a lot of startups and early stage companies listening to this usually ask themselves is, when you first went to hire and you're like, all right, we have money, we need to generate revenue, we need to hire. What was the first position or positions you've hired and what was the rationale to picking that type of, I need to hire here first over maybe something else? For example, maybe you decided sales over more engineers or more engineers over more marketing. Like, So what was like your first hire and why did you decide that? I would, yeah, so Sorry, I just wanna poke in. This is especially valuable because you're in the tech, the tech motherland, right? Entrepreneur uh, engineers are, ran are running around like rampant wildfire out there. So just highlighting <laughs> that for everyone. Higher <laughs> grade engineers than it is. Uh, but um, so our, our first hires, let's see, I'll, I'll break down our first 10. because there's sort of a surge of hiring from the four founders to about 10 people. And then we sat there for about five months uh, before we made another hire. Um, so we, the first hires were, I think it was like three engineers and a designer. Um, so that got us to eight, and then uh, someone to run sales, and someone to run support, and then uh, an office manager. And so that was sort of the core team. Uh, we got two customer-facing people, uh, and then the sort of product engineering team of whatever, six or seven people, um, and office manager and myself. Uh, that was sort of the initial core. And uh, I, I think it was like a pretty good balance. And the, the, I guess the reason we chose those things is we had a lot of stuff still that we wanted to build. So most of the investment went into uh, a team that could really push on that. Uh, and then we also just realized that, hey, we weren't that great at support, nor were we, and I was absolutely terrible at sales. So, uh, you know, those are weaknesses that we wanted to complement. So we wanted to continue investing in one area, then we wanted to invest in, um, in areas where we knew we were weak and where our complement would really like make a dramatic difference. So one of my big questions for people who need to hire outside of skill set, an area they have no experience in, let's say for you, lack of sales, and you need to hire someone to help with sales, what would you recommend to them in that situation? If you're hiring an area that you really have no real skill set in or don't know a higher level? Yeah, so there we, um, so we found our first uh, sales, sales rep, Raph, who is now our, our VP of sales. Uh, so we found him through our, an advisor, basically, a sales advisor who was helping me. Um, so I guess the key there was we got an intro to someone who we thought could be helpful, turned out he was super helpful, and then he helped us hire the first sales rep. And I think that's that's the way we've uh, hired several senior roles is actually by finding someone super senior who can be an advisor and help find the like up and coming person to actually fill the role. Um, and uh, I, I think that's probably a pretty repeatable pattern. And that, that super senior person might be an investor or it might be uh, just someone in the community who, um, so like for example, uh, the people officer at Twilio. Uh, she was no longer at Twilio, but you know, obviously had a lot of a lot of cred. So she she works with us as an advisor, um, and she helped us find and search for our head of HR. Do you do you feel like, sorry? Do you feel like you know kind of with what stage you guys are at? Uh, obviously, you guys have grown. You're at at scale. Do you feel like the problems you're solving now really are are just how do we scale this business like you're talking about, or do you guys still find yourselves, you know, trying to solve these different problems for these analytics platforms, you know, on the more product side? Like, where's kind of that like that balance right now for you guys? Oh, we we have a it's both simultaneously. <laughs> um, we have a huge amount of stuff that we still want to build in the product, uh, and we um, at the same time, have product market fit with the existing thing and probably have 0.2% market share. So we certainly want to grow in terms of just uh, adoption of the existing product, but we also have a vision of where we want to take that product. Um, and uh, so we, we're like simultaneously investing in both. And the reason also, I, I know you mentioned earlier that you kind of, you kind of got, let's see, you, you said mixed panel kiss metrics, are they still kind of like top dog you're trying to pull market share from? Or I know you mentioned earlier you kind of working your product actually works in uh, harmony with them in a way because you're you're becoming like a, a filter or a funnel for what they have. Yeah, that's right. So we we definitely don't compete with them. Um, so segment is basically pipes for the data, uh, and Kiss Metrics and Mixed Panel are two examples of tools that can actually do interesting things with that data at the end of the pipes that go through segment. And so uh, you know, for us. Um, 
yeah, I mean, they're, they're fantastic partners. I think there's there's a lot of other partners that are of the similar scale now on uh, that we can send data to. So early on, how are you guys finding customers? Like when you're very, very like team of 10, how are you going out finding customers back then? And compared to now, how are you finding customers? So a little compare and contrast. Yeah, actually at the very beginning, so first day, right, was launch on Hacker News. We got a few thousand email signups. Uh, then we built the hosted version of, of Analytics.js that weekend and then sent emails out to all of those uh, customers, inviting all the people who had signed up at launch onto the uh, onto the new hosted thing. Um, so with that, we got the first like 100 or so customers. And then uh, after that, we launched and like announced our funding and stuff like that on TechCrunch. So that got us a little spurt. Um, and we launched on Hacker News, which got us a little spurt. And then after that, we we really focused on content marketing. So we uh, built something called the Analytics Academy, um, which has like tens of thousands of subscribers. Um, and they, uh, it's basically like an introduction to how to think about analytics, how to think about these third party tools, how to think about um, using data to improve the customer experience uh, in your product. And so that we really, for the most part, have just done content marketing and then have had a lot of organic growth um, based on like word of mouth referral. It's very interesting you bring that up, content, because I mean, this podcast alone is content that we put under a company. And I actually write every day, every morning when I first wake up, it's like meditative to me is write two blog posts, which then I give to my um, to my chief of staff, who's also like my part time proof editor, because my um, English is absolutely terrible. Um, but it, it is real content. And a, a little tip for you or anyone who's creating content, what I've learned that's very useful, and I, I learned this tip from a Seth Godin quote, which is write what you're angry about. And now it doesn't mean like you're going to be pissed all about, but usually that's where the most enthusiasm is going to come from when it comes to content. So it's always been intriguing to me, and it's usually going to be a relevant topic that can be shareable in the moment, which is going to have the best chance of virality and impact. So it's an interesting life hack of learning. It's truly made a difference. But I'm curious, what made you guys decide we're going to get into content marketing because but content marketing is definitely a long-term investment too right if you're looking at it definitely you're only going to get a fraction of the people to sign up because most of the people are just giving out free value to so my question for you is what made you guys say we're going to get into content marketing too how long did you see to see the dividends and that starting to pay off and you know third bonus question here because i love asking a lot of questions at once who's creating the content for you? yeah so first question how do we i think we just didn't know anything else <laughs> um, we had written blog posts, like as founders, we had written blog posts uh, that did pretty well on Hacker News. Like I wrote about uh, radioactivity and nuclear reactors and stuff like that. It had done well. Uh, and so we were like, well, like, why don't we just do that on this other topic? And that'll probably like attract a lot of people. So let's do that. Um, you know, not the most sophisticated uh, approach in terms of marketing, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it worked. People liked the content because we put a lot of effort into it. Um, and so originally it was myself and uh, my co-founder Ian who wrote most of the content on um, on Analytics Academy, and then we distributed primarily through Hacker News. And um, then later on, so now we're starting to grow a marketing team. So there's um, two technical writers, um, director of Demand Gen. Um, there's a, a paid person who works on who was actually starting on Monday and works on that team. Um, and so that team together produces a lot of the content. And then uh, I still produce quite a bit of content. Uh, and uh, we work with a like contributed content company where I answer a bunch of questions and then they help formulate it into like a consistent, um, a consistent essay. And then I edit it and then it goes live. Um, and so that goes, that goes live. I'm actually going to ask you a question on the latter one because this is an area I've been kind of like semi interested in myself as our revenue grows and we have more ways to invest back into scale. Mm -hmm. When did you make the decision? Maybe we're going to hire an outside company to help with that too. And why did you make that decision? So I'm just curious. This is for my own biases, but I'm actually really. <laughs> Super good question. I think uh, it, actually, it wasn't my idea, um, and it was a sort of decision that that Brent, our director of demand gen, uh, made. And he uh, basically was just like, "Look, the answering the questions, like coming up with what's interesting, um, that we can't outsource that. Like that has to be from the heart. It has to be like." Uh, what segment really thinks it has to be what you really think, um, but the the effort required to make that like a polished uh, essay or a polished post um, that's super time consuming, but not actually uh, unique. It's not a unique skill or unique value that you add to it. So um, 
his, his thought was, okay, you're going to answer the questions. It's going to be your content. You're even going to put the final edits on it. So that it's really in your voice. But the interim piece of taking it from questions to something semi-polished in the English language, like that can be someone else. Uh, and so that was when we decided to outsource that as sort of a time-saving mechanism and a way for uh, me to produce more, like get more thinking out there faster. And how long would you say you guys are sticking at it, doing that daily till you start seeing like dividends from it? Like, holy crap, this is actually working. Uh, so the way that the way the pattern currently works is I answer questions about once every two weeks. Um, so I get a question set, I answer once every answer it over the weekend. The next week it goes and they write it, and then I, a week of editing, and then I get another question set. Um, so it's it's not a daily cadence; it's it's a, it's a biweekly cadence. And one more content, so we're not going just content here. How often yeah. are you guys overall as a company putting out content? Is it daily, once a week, every couple of days? Like, what would you say is that ratio right now? I'd probably say once every couple of days. Gotcha, gotcha. That's it fascinating. Could be, it, could be, it could be a case study. It could be like a blog article. It could be like a, here's what's going on under the hood. It could be like here's how we think the world should think about this problem. The interesting context here for me is the fact that your content, like, this is something any star could do with no money. You could be completely bootstrapped and doing content marketing if you truly are able to write well and you're passionate about it, right? And you can do something that people are going to relate to. So it's an interesting context because a lot of companies you hear worry about, oh, my God, how am I going to market? Like, you know, how am I going to yeah. build awareness? So it's fascinating to be here. Um, I, I really think this is something that people need to be more open about. So, all right, let's talk about segment the product itself for a minute because, you know, this is one of the reasons you're on here. We need to, we need to, we need to plug in a segment here. So – how has the product changed over the years from when it first originated to, you know, where are you guys going with it right now? And what makes you excited about it? Yeah, so we started with just collecting data from people's websites, right? So that was Analytics.js. And we could collect data from the websites and we could fan it out to five tools downstream. It was Mixpanel, Kissmetrics, Google Analytics, Olark, and Intercom. Those were the first five. Um, and what we discovered is that, A, people really had a problem there and they didn't want they would desperately wanted one thing to install on their website that could send their data anywhere, um, but uh, that five tools was not anywhere, right? They wanted more tools. Uh, and so we went from those five tools to uh, 140 tools over the next uh, year and a half, and or two and a half years. And um, so the first big push was basically just like, all right, let's build more integrations because people have, you know, now we have 65 analytics tools, like 40 email marketing tools. Like people just use a lot of different tools um, and they tend to be very niche. So like the email marketing tool that they use in Europe is different than the one that they use on Australia is different than the one that a mobile company uses in Florida, which is different than the one that they use in San Francisco. So it's like, there's a lot of like niche tools. That people use. Um, so the second thing was that people didn't want to just collect data from their websites. They also wanted to collect data from their mobile apps and they also wanted to collect data from their servers. And so, um, we basically started branching out. So we now, okay, now we could collect data from, uh, from their websites, from their mobile apps, from their servers, and we can fan it out to 140 tools. And that was where we were last spring, uh, around this time. And what we realized then was that the, um, basically we couldn't maintain those 140 connections anymore, right? We couldn't build 140 integrations. And so we said, well, you know, we, we have a lot of customers now. What if our partners actually go and build these integrations? Like what if we just let them do it themselves? Because they really want to be on the platform. Like let's let them do it. And uh, so we published a spec for how partners could receive data from Segment, and then they started building. So now we have about 200 integrations, um, and you know at that point we could still just accept data from people's products. And the, awesome. the next step we realized was that people actually don't like collecting the data from inside people's products is exciting, but people actually want like a much broader view. Like there's all these other customer interactions, all these other customer touch points that are beyond what's just happening in this thin slice of what's happening in their product, right? Like people uh, get emails and they open and click those. There's a payment system, there's help desks, there's their sales team is interacting in their CRM. There's all these surveys, NPS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these other customer touch points and the data is siloed in each of those. And so last week we launched sources, which basically pulls in data from all those places into segment and then we can fan it back out again. Um, so, the, uh, the sort of core, what we want to be is the central repository for all the customers or all of a, a company's customer data and then the routing layer to uh, all the different places where they want to use it. I love the analogy you used before about you guys being like pipes because this is actually, you're almost like a digital version of a pipe system for like, <laughs> like, but for data, you know, to me, you guys are that behind the scenes infrastructure that society depends on. 
Like that's how it's kind of, I, I hear it when like I try to visualize my head a digital entity like what you guys are. Yeah, we, we alternately switch between like the uh, the digital sewer system for everyone's data and we're like the data janitors. Um, <laughs> or uh, that we visualize a segment as like a tree uh, where we've got the root system that's collecting data and then the, the fruits up top where we're actually seeing the data. You always beat a municipality that's running the, the parks department and you got both happening at the same time. <laughs> so yeah dan go ahead i've been I was, asking quite a few questions recently so. was, no yeah uh, no it's I, i'm sorry i've been kind of sucked into the story like i love this stuff like i'm an engineer so this is uh, again i'm overly excited but um so it's so funny so you said okay so you guys opened it up so basically i don't want to call it user content generation but your customers you open it up and then they started developing integrations for you and then you said you know, there's all these other things now that we're seeing. So do you feel like that was kind of like the key that's unlocking a lot of more op or the, the larger opportunity market opportunity for you guys where you can start, you know, taking your product and going down all these different routes you're kind of describing? Uh, so there definitely was a key for us. For a long time, we were putting a lot of effort into maintaining the integrations. And so it was definitely a key turning point for us when our partners, so not our customers, but our partners uh, started building their connection to segments rather than us building the connection from us to the partner, the partner built the segment. Um, and um, that's key because the, there's like the, an ecosystem out there of like somewhere between 2,000 and 12,000 marketing tools and uh, and sales tools and so on and so forth. So it's probably like 10 or 20,000 tools. Um, and we just can't, we can't build the connections to all of those. So allowing our partners in that ecosystem to build the segment has been a uh, huge So, uh, uh, So as that kind of started happening, you know, with the vision yeah. that you kind of have for the products, how aligned was that for you guys? Or was it more like, hey, here's what we're thinking, but now it's like, look at this golden goose here kind of starting to develop and how awesome our partners are doing this for you. you know, like, was there alignment there? Or was this like a whole, again, just a total fork in the road for you guys? Uh, no, there was good alignment there. I mean, I don't think I don't think we ever thought it would be possible for us to build 10,000 integrations. So <laughs> it was clear that uh, somehow it was gonna have to become a little more distributed. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, 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 uh, we took a little bit of a risky bet and we transitioned over to partners, but um, they're excited to work with us. And so, so off we go. What's been your biggest learning curve in your last five, six years? What? Um, probably learning how to manage. Um, like the, the company at first is like a mad dash to just get a product that works. And so you're, you're really spending all your time building product, building product. And then in the last two years, that's really it's really transitioned to more like building the company. Um, like I'm, I'm certainly not the one building the product anymore, right? Uh, and so it's it's how do you build a company that enables people to build great products to market it well, etc. Um, Did you ever and, have the hurdle of asking yourself, do I belong more in the product? Or I guess let me rephrase it: Have you ever asked yourself, should I be working in the business or working on the business? Did you ever face that question and figure out and have internal conflict behind that? Or did you know, I want to just be working on the business, not in the business ultimately? It's a good question. I definitely have had that debate uh, with myself. Um, ultimately, I think I, I do want to be working on the business as opposed to uh, in the business. Really? Uh, yeah. Do your co-founders share that, do you think? The reason I ask is I know engineers, they like being in the business. They like solving the problems. Yeah. Um, so I think my, my co-founders actually prefer to work in the business. Uh, okay. The one runs product now and the other uh, runs infrastructure engineering. Cool. Uh, and are, well, I mean, they're, they're obviously interested in both, otherwise they wouldn't have wanted to, to start a company. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think when, when push comes to shove, I think they, they enjoy uh, working on the, on the infrastructure and, and product more directly. Here's a very um, self-aware question here, but it's going to be very deep, so I'm curious your answer. What is your biggest weakness right now that you are personally working on? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so I think, um, have you ever heard of the Colby uh, personality test? Um, no, I, I have. Yeah, all right. So uh, it basically splits down personality into like four dimensions, sort of like Myers-Briggs, but a little different. Um, and the first category is basically, do you like simplifying things? or do you like going and getting a lot more information? And then there's another category, which is basically, do you sort of uh, quickly start things or do you like to maintain existing processes? Um, and I like to quickly start things and I like to simplify things. So, um, but that's not always good, right? Like if you're gonna make a really big decision, it'd be much better. Sometimes it's good to just like, you can't get more information. And so just like make a decision and move on. Um, but 
oftentimes you can get quite a bit more information, in which case it's actually uh, super important that you go and actually get all the facts uh, before and do a ton of research before you make a big decision. Um, so making sure that uh, you sort of appropriately identify whether it's possible to get more information and then going a little bit against my nature uh, when it is appropriate to go research a bunch uh, and making sure that that research gets done. I think uh, it's, it's basically comes down to like, a big part of my role is decision making, uh, whether I whether I like it or not, um, and um, just making sure that those decisions are super high quality is, is is what I owe to the company. Let me take a wild guess. You are an INTJ or an INTP, maybe? INTJ. INTJ nailed it. Definitely, Josh. You must take go to sixteenpersonalities.net and take that. That is I a. Can't. You know me very well. What am I going to be? So I know ahead of time. Definitely an E. Definitely an extra the extrovert. Um, I don't, I'm very introverted. <laughs> very introverted. That, I don't know. It's it's. I don't know. Is you need to take it because it's really interesting, and we actually make that part of our our team, and all of that is is understanding. You know, what's your personality? How do you work? What's your swim lane? And then how to work with that and make you most successful, so you're never no suffering in silence. You know, <laughs> so that's a good guess. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So complete a complete the sentence for me. All right. In order to scale company, you must X. Uh, Stop doing everything. I like that one. I like that one. So what is your, this is an interesting question, but I am curious about this one too. What's your normal sleeping habit? What time do you usually go to bed and what time do you usually wake? I usually go to bed at 1130 and I wake up at 645. Do you go to the gym or work out? Uh, yeah, usually once I, when I wake up, I usually go and run. So I, I had a super hard time getting myself to work out. So I decided eventually, like, okay, look, you have to work out every day. That's what I tell myself. You have to work out every day, but you only have to work out for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so, so like, but at that point, you're like, well, you can't argue with yourself that you don't have 15 minutes. Like, it's true. Seriously, like, you definitely have 15 minutes. Um, so you could be in sales. That was a good pitch. So, uh, so um, yeah, anyway, so 15 minutes, it usually ends up being more than that, but that, that's what I promised. Five years from now, we're a segment. Boy, that's a good question. Um, I mean, if everything goes as we plan, we'll be a significantly bigger company. Um, I think we, um, you know, we, we see like a pretty big opportunity around becoming the customer data system of record. Um, so, you know, becoming the, the, the company that has sort of all the customer data for all of our customers and becoming a platform that other companies then are building off of and doing interesting things with that data. Uh, I think that's a huge opportunity. I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, no one has ever built a company in sort of like that category before. Um, so yeah, I, it's, uh, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, you know, we, we want to build one of the sort of like big lasting internet companies. Um, and, uh, it's a pretty like big ambitious goal, but I, I think it's uh, within reason given the, the category that we stumbled into. What do you want your personal legacy to be when it's all said and done? Oh man, that is a tough question. You're going hard today, man. Yeah. Um, I think it comes, I think, uh, it's actually an interesting question. I, I, in the past, I think I probably would have defined it more as um, like specific things that I had built or accomplished. Uh, I think I would actually define it a little bit differently now. Uh, I think I would define it as um, are the people that I'm working with and, and, and managing now, are do they do they respect, do they have like a high opinion and respect for um, the way in which I have led the organization or the way in which I have helped build the team um, for the decisions that I've made around helping them uh, and helping the company succeed? I think like uh, if, I, if I'm just doing my job super, super well, um, then uh, I think that's, I sort of aspire to basically um, them having a super high opinion of, uh, of my leadership of the company. So one more big question. I'll turn it for Dan for any final questions here. But I'm curious about this too. As a growing company, you deal with a lot of stresses and a lot of things are out of your control. A lot of things are in your control. Yeah. How, how do you handle stress in your situation? Like what do you do to keep yourself like grounded, even keel? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, three things. One, exercise every morning. Uh, two is actually take vacation. I think a lot of founders and entrepreneurs don't do that. I'm fairly religious about it. Last year, I took a three-week break to travel around the world with my wife. 
Um, we took a couple other one-week trips. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because it highlights like what is it that you're still needed for? Uh, and like that's, you find actually that the company actually does quite well without you. Um, and so, uh, so what is it that you're still really needed for? And then you can double down on that. Um, and uh, the third thing is read. I think reading gives like a, a really good perspective uh, that, you know, all these things are about getting perspective, right? It's about getting perspective in the moment, getting perspective by leaving the physical area. You read a lot of fiction or nonfiction? All nonfiction. I can't stand fiction. Yes, engineer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Do you, I actually don't want to hear one more for fun. Are you? Are, I, I noticed a huge influx of successful entrepreneurs who don't watch a lot of like television content, but when they do, they are like heavy binge watchers. They'll go all in. So when you watch content, are you a yeah. binge or a classic, I'll go and enjoy myself at a movie type person? I'm curious. I want to. Uh, so I think I probably would, in my natural state, I would probably be a binge watcher of like some new humor comedy thing. Uh, my wife keeps me in check though. So <laughs> That's what they're here for, our significant other, right? To make sure our entertainment content is always being absorbed in one way, shape or form. Yeah. But I, I could, if I was by myself, I could very easily just like stay up for 30 hours straight and like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, going back to your vacation for yeah, it's very interesting to me you bring this up because I 100% agree with you. It's been the greatest analysis for me to look at. All right, I was gone for a week. What happened in a week that I noticed is a metric that either maybe was impacted or didn't get impacted, always assumed. So it's a great exercise. But also, I'm actually a huge daycationer. So my idea is a lot of times when I'm like focused for six months, like this next six months, my goal is to double the revenue of our company. How are we going to do that? Reverse engineer it. My goal is I realize myself is I can get burned out. I, I'm very self-aware. I realize if I don't get enough sleep or I don't exercise or do certain things, I will get burned out. But I've stumbled upon my love of vacations for perspective. One of the vacations I did in 2013 was a good friend of mine. is a huge San Francisco Giants fan. I'm a diehard Phillies fan. Unfortunately, for the greater good, that's what I am. <laughs> and we decided, why don't we go to San Francisco to go watch the Phillies Giants play? It was like in August. So a vacation was the... We left at 6 in the morning. We flew from Philly to San Fran, landed about 10 a.m., ate an In-N-Out burger because you're in California for like 18 hours. What are you going to do? You're going to eat an In-N-Out burger. Um, went to the game, hung out like Chinatown, flew back home, was back to work the next day here in Philadelphia. And that's like an example of a vacation. And to me, it also maintains that m mindset of like quick pace that I love. I flourish by it. But at the same point in time, I'm out of that context temporarily. So it's kind of like that win-win scenario there. So it's just, that that's kind of, again, my own self-awareness. And I think as a CEO of a company or founder, you need to maintain that level of what truly making sure you understand what makes you tick. Because if you don't know that, how are you going to expect your company to flourish, right? How are you going to understand the environment you need to be in in order to put your company, your team in the best situation possible? So, yeah. you know, that's a true belief. So, all right, Dan, any, I'll let you fo follow up with any final questions before we wrap this up. You're on mute right now, man. I don't know if you have to mute. I'm sorry. There's so many people walking. I'm in an incubator right now, so it's, it's just loud all the time. But uh, how about just totally segue off work? What's uh, what's one hobby or fun thing you do outside of, outside of your job every day? Mm. Uh, I mean, I mentioned this one before, but reading. Actually, I really read a lot. Uh, really? Cool. Yeah. And, um, business books, um, but also like history. I just read a book on the, uh, the Dervish War, which was a, a war in Sudan in 1890s. Um, it's like very interesting how you like the war books for tac like tacticality. Do you read it for like the actual like tacticalness and are you, is that someone or do you just like it for the history side of things? Uh, just for that one, just for the history side of things. Um, I also read a history of uh, like logging in Washington, kind of like lumber logging in Washington State. That was interesting. Um, I think it's just like these expand perspectives in interesting ways. Um, so. Do you have any uh, top recommendations for uh, other entrepreneurs out there that they might want to read outside the history stuff potentially? I know there's a lot of good ones out there. There are a lot of good ones out there. I think the the one that inspired me most, as, as the company sort of crossed through like 20 to 30 people, uh, I read a book um, by Louis, Louis Gerstner, uh, who says elephants can't dance. Um, and it's about the sort of like history of IBM's transition um, from um, sort of like one era to another and the sort of like cultural change and leadership that was required then. And that was the first time I, I felt like I had been exposed to like a true executive. And I was like, holy shit, like, all right, this is like a, <laughs> a 
perspective, um, and uh, I think it was like pretty inspiring uh, as far as like a, a read for that stage. Of, like, I'll need to add it to my um, bookshelf behind me. It's like I, my catalog of favorite books are on my bookshelf at all time for me just to pick up at any point in time to absorb. I got the link in the chat. So who says Please. elephants can't da dance? I believe it's, it's correct me if I'm wrong here that you get like $5 for everyone that buys a book, right? That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> we we set this up before we got on the on the blab even. Yeah. He's gonna make money from my link. <laughs> All right, so Peter, how can people either reach you and or your company or learn more about? Yeah, for sure. You can uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, just at segment and uh, or me at Ryan PK. So R I N dot PK or R I N PK. Yeah. This was fun, man. When you guys um, are you, when you increase, like triple your growth, we're gonna have you back on again, and we're gonna pick your brain on what happened between now, like then and now. Because um, I have no doubt in my mind that segment's not going to be literally the tree trunk of the internet and mobile, which even mobile we barely got into. But I see a lot of things. So everyone listening on the podcast, make sure to check out Peter. Make sure to check out segment. Reach out to them. And I'll say, if you if you end up being a customer because of the show, make sure to let them know it's because of the show. So <laughs> we can fill our own egos. Um, awesome. Peter, anything you want to add before we, we wrap this up? No, thanks so much for having me. Awesome. You've been Good listening talking. to episode 12 of the podcast. Brought to you by ChopDog.com. Dog is D-A-W-G. Helping you bring your mobile app, web app, wearable app, software to life, enterprise, startups, and everything in between. Thank you, everyone. And we will talk again soon. And we will pause now.